So um, welcome back, everyone. For our last talk today, we have Emily Pilmer. Um, Emily writes a lot of Haskell. Take it away, Emily. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I intentionally kept that intro short because I didn't want to have it take up too much time. But also, that's pretty much all I do is I write Haskell. <laughs> so, you know, you can't get too, um, I guess, grandiose about it. Uh, so this is the last talk of the day. And I wanted to keep it light. Uh, so I did a talk on something that isn't super technically heavy, uh, but was an interesting correspondence that I thought um, was good for driving intuition and kind of helping people's uh, imaginations run a little wild with uh, bringing different abstractions from different fields and from different places into Haskell and showing that it can actually produce meaningful results that maybe we haven't seen before. Uh, just because, you know, we're bringing in a new point of view that translates really well through this sort of universal language of category theory. And this isn't going to be a category theory talk, per se. There will be a lot of sort of categorical stuff uh, going on in the background, which I would encourage everyone to uh, research on their own time, or maybe hit me up after the chat, maybe during the Q&A, and I can give you the resources that I use to build this kind of theory. Um, but we're not going to focus on that. And instead, we're going to focus on sort of concrete uh, examples that we can actually do in real life and that I will actually do in, in sort of real time for you on camera, um, not in code, but in terms of uh, just like the basic shapes that we're going to be using. Um, so let's get started. Um, the title of the talk is called Hulk Smash, but let's get started. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I do a lot of Haskell. Uh, I do Haskell full time. I spend a lot of my time doing libraries that I think would be sort of best for everyone in the ecosystem. Uh, and then in my spare time, I do a lot of math. Um, and in particular, I try and focus on category theory and topology. Uh, and for the last you know, year or so, it's kind of been dead due to COVID. But for the last year, it's been almost exclusively category theory. Um, so I'm trying to pivot to that and, you know, just sort of separate my, my concerns in terms of uh, work and play. Um, I'm on Twitter. You might know me as um, sort of at PyTopos, which is a conjunction of my, the first two letters of my last name and then uh, an online handle that I have. So it's nothing special if you were looking for that particular uh, phrase on NLAB or something. Uh, I do a lot of community stuff. Um, a lot of meetups. Uh, when I was in New York City, uh, I recently moved in the past month, but when I was in New York City for the past five years, um, I was working, uh, hosting the New York Homotopy Type Theory Group, as well as the New York Category Theory Group uh, as a co-host running through um, two books, Emily Reel's Category Theory and Context, uh, and one which sort of fizzled out, which was going to go through uh, categories for the working mathematician by McLean. I'm happy to still do those. I would love to move them online, which I feel is the only avenue <laughs> these days. So if you would like to be a part of that, just uh, send me a message after this as well. Uh, I recently moved to Asheville, North Carolina to be in the woods and uh, get all of my math kicks while taking it easy. Uh, but I still managed to start up two groups, uh, the Asheville Functional Programming Group, which has yet to have its first uh, uh, meetup, mostly due to COVID, but we'll be hosting that soon, uh, as well as the Asheville Category Theory Group, which I'm the only member <laughs> currently. So if you know anyone that wants to get into it in the area, I'm happy to host, I'm happy to help people out, and I'm perfectly fine with doing uh, a group of two. Yeah, that just means it's a little bit more intimate in terms of uh, what we can talk about and how in-depth we get into things. Uh, all of my slides and meetup content are hosted on the cohomology GitHub account, which is uh, the domain I own. I just have a GitHub associated with it. And once you get these slides, you can actually click the link and it'll you know, take you right there. Uh, otherwise, I'll post them in the chat when we're done. Right. Uh, my start was in Scala, just so everyone knows. Um, I started with Runar Bjarnason's uh, uh, functional programming in Scala, and I moved on to Haskell in the past two years professionally. 
Uh, and now I'm, I'm actually doing, I think, more work professionally with Koch than I am with Haskell. Uh, so it, it's been an interesting uh, progression through the space. <clears throat> I work for a blockchain company called Kadena. Um, we try and do a sort of principled, formally verified uh, uh, language in addition to uh, a private and public blockchain that we integrate and, and try and uh, offer as a service as opposed to doing the uh, sort of ICO thing, right? Blockchain is a, a useful data structure as opposed to a, a sort of, you know, gamble on my token experience. <laughs> Um, yeah, so like I said, this is going to be a light talk. It's going to be uh, a little bit more about the maybe monad than I think uh, people were, uh, I think people are used to, uh, particularly because we'll go into different types of uh, pointed objects, which the maybe monad uh, sort of defines in terms of uh, its behavior, right? So what the maybe monad is doing is going into this this category of, of pointed objects and coming back with a new object which has a sort of base point adjoint to it. And this is a, an interesting uh, monad to talk about, particularly because in a lot of topology, in a lot of algebraic topology, we, we study geometric objects with base points attached. And these base points give us interesting intuition and often the only significant intuition, picking a base point and looking at its behavior in a space that we actually need to define invariance about the space, right? And one of the cool things about this perspective, this base point perspective, defining invariance, is that we can translate this almost uh, literally in a discrete form from the concepts that we, we look at in topology back into Haskell, and we actually end up with some interesting results. So uh, for the first half of this talk, you can kind of just sit back and visualize in your head. There's no real uh, conversation to have uh, other than you can sort of stare and wrap your head around the geometric objects that we're going to talk about and maybe follow along with some of the, uh, the sort of physical examples that we're going to have. And then just, you know, take it easy, basically. It's the end of the day. Yeah, so we're going to enjoy ourselves. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's get into some geometry, right? In classical point set topology, we consider uh, topology and geometry in terms of uh, sets of points. And like I said, often in, in, in looking at these geometric objects, we want to study invariants about the space that sort of define the baseline geometry that we're working with. So for instance, things like how apart are, are two different points, can we even tell? Uh, if two points are apart. Can we talk about whether the space is possibly two disjoint copies of some uh, geometric objects? Can we talk about whether it, it's packed into a finite uh, interval? Can we talk about um, its limits, like where is its boundary, and that kind of thing? And it starts by looking at uh, individual points, right? So we can we sort of imagine the circle and we, we think about, oh, where is its origin, right? We, we think about like uh, zero, one on the sort of Cartesian graph, right, in, in R2. And we say, oh, okay, here's where it starts. And then we, we say, oh, look, we can go around it by, you know, two pi and we end up back in the same place. There's an invariant. Um, and we can just proceed like that, right? So we often think about, um, these geometric objects in terms of pairs of the space and the dedicated uh, base point that we're gonna be talking about, right? That will help us uh, figure out where the invariants lie. And it doesn't have to be just a point, but you know, just to drive home the metaphor that I'm, I'm building here, we're just gonna focus on a point, but it is possible to do this with uh, sets of points defining the space, like packages of information, which give you all, or at least the minimum amount of information you need to talk about all the invariants in a space or some of the invariants. Um, and in some cases, when you're doing sort of higher level topology, you don't even consider base points at all. And you consider things like uh, the fundamental groupoid, right? Which is, you know, kind of the, the groupoid that you build is like categorically equivalent to like the automorphism group of uh, 
any one of these points within the space. And it, it's sometimes really nice to deal with just the whole space instead of the space and a point. Uh, so it's only for the purposes of this talk where we're going to focus on just the, the single point case. Right? Now, in the same way that we can do this in Haskell, right, we can build tuples, we can build uh, you know, either A or B, the co-product, um, in quotient spaces, which is a little, little bit tougher and a little bit more implicit, but I think Derek Elkins just did a talk on that, so I'd, I, I didn't watch it, but <laughs> I want to watch the, uh, the replay of that because it was probably the most interesting talk that I, uh, that and Bartosh's were probably the most interesting to me. Uh, I just didn't get a chance to watch it, but uh, they are interesting concepts in and of themselves, and these identification spaces, these quotient spaces, uh, I'm going to go a little bit more in detail into so that we can drive the, the geometric intuition forward. Uh, but for products and co-products, I'll go kind of quickly just because we're, we're kind of used to that, that kind of construction, right? So the product of two topological spaces or geometric objects uh, is kind of simple, right? You imagine you have like two squares or something or uh, two cubes and you want to take the, the sort of Cartesian product of these things, you would sort of build the grid and you would look at, uh, you know, where they intersect and the sort of spaces where they don't. And uh, we're kind of familiar with this, right? Uh, it's the exact same way that you do things in uh, topology. So for example, I have a circle and uh, actually I can, I can just do it right now with my paper. I have a circle and I can extrude it along the, the unit interval here. And, uh, you know, there's your cylinder, right? So we're familiar with this kind of stuff. Coproducts are a little bit more subtle. Um, a pointed coproduct is something where we, you know, there, there's a, a notion of a disjoint union of two spaces. But if we're considering base points, often uh, the sort of proper coproduct that we have is something called a wedge sum, where we, uh, oh, sorry, uh, where we have uh, something like uh, two geometric objects with two different base points, say two circles, and we conflate the base points. We just call them the same thing and we hook them together like that. And that's our form of addition that, that we're gonna work, work with. That's, our, that's the notion that we're gonna call coproduct, okay? And these are examples of things called quotient spaces. So just to, to drive it home, um, you know, you, you have say two circles here, you want to form a coproduct, you would specify two separate base points and you would kind of paste them together, one on top of each other and call the base point the same. And uh, that's, that's what we're, we're calling a wedge sum, yeah? Um, you can, if for example, you have uh, these concepts like uh, the topological rows where you, like what I said, you take two circles and you paste them together at the base points and you form these kinds of co-product spaces where you can go through A back to a base point or B and back to a base point again. Uh, or, you know, in the, the case of four individual pedals, you have, you know, A, B, C, D, and you have a choice of traversing through whatever you want to do as long as you, you come back to the base point, right? So uh, quotients can get kind of complex, right? That was a kind of simple one. Take two base points and paste them together. Um, but we do this all the time in terms of uh, other geometric objects. So for example, example the, uh, the torus, uh, which is two circles, which you can see identified on the skeleton of the torus here, uh, extruded around each other, right? So this is a Cartesian product of, of two circles. Um, except we've, we sort of modulo out by a relation where we say uh, all of the, the X's on the, the top, so this is where the physical examples come in. If this is my, my X axis and this is my Y axis, then we say, you know, we're gonna identify the, the sort of boundaries here to build the circle. And then we're gonna take the, the Y side and on both sides at sort of Y zero and sorry, uh, zero Y and one Y, and we're gonna identify those together to form a donut. So you end up with something like uh, a really bad torus right here, which has some thickness, but it's folded really poorly, right? 
So this is an example of like a quotient space. And you can just imagine this as I'm taping together the relations and, and sort of pasting them to form a new space, which has uh, interesting properties in and of itself, right? So when we talk about the torus, we often talk about, oh, the torus is isomorphic to S1 cross S1. Not quite, it's, it's actually isomorphic to the quotient uh, that we build right here. And the syntax, just for anyone that's new uh, to this sort of mathematical relative syntax here, this means that when I say x comma zero uh, tilde x comma one, we're saying all points x uh, on the grid, you know, if I have like an x, y axis, all points at x can vary, but we're going to fix zero. So it's going to be the, uh, sorry, the, the bottom of the square. And we're going to relate these tilde with all x's on the top. So we're just pasting the bottom edge of the square to the top edge of the square. And then likewise, you know, doing the same slightly different thing for, for y's, right? So what I'm building is kind of this, this visual right here, where you match blue to blue, you call them the same, uh, you just sort of identify them together, uh, and you can build interesting stuff. Uh, so for instance, the, the cylinder is built this way, like I just, I just showed you. Uh, the sphere is built this way, where we, we sort of identify uh, points on, in R2. We kind of wrap up the entire plane and we pinch the end and call it a point, right? And that defines the sphere. Uh, and in the same way, you can build a torus or, or a Mobius band, right? Where you take this, say, and you twist. So you notice that the, uh, <clears throat> the sort of x-axis is being identified uh, in an inverse direction. And then you just paste them together and it forms a Mobius band, right? So that's what we talk about when we say quotient spaces. Um, and you can try this at home, you know, and just visualize for yourself uh, the Klein bottle, the projective plane, uh, Mobius bands, tori, they're all examples of these sort of interesting quotient spaces, uh, which, you know, at lower dimensions, you can just do with tape and paper, which I thought was pretty cool. Right. Uh, there's a little lesser known type of product that we often call the smash product or the collapsed product. Um, and this is slightly harder to visualize, but you can imagine um, a product modulo a wedge, right? So the quotient of a product with a wedge. Um, and we can get into visualizations of this. I, I actually have one that's uh, very intuitive that I couldn't embed because I'm terrible at LaTeX uh, that we can actually look at here if you want to go through it, right? So for instance, um, the torus modulo the wedge of two circles. What do we get? Well, let's build the torus. We see we have S1, we're extruding around another circle. So we've built S1 cross S1. Uh, modulo that re that set of relations that we looked at in the torus where we sort of just identify the the sort of edges with each other right and then we slowly start moduloing out the the torus modulo this this uh, these red circles which define the wedge that that uh, defines the skeleton of the torus right so we just we start conflating those to a point they get smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually as you sort of approach a sort of uh, compacted point here, uh, you can see you eventually start to form a sphere. So you've actually formed the two sphere. Um, so it is a, a theorem in, in topology that, you know, or an application of the theorem in topology that the torus modulo uh, the wedge product of, of two circles is isomorphic to S2, uh, which is just to say the smash product of two circles. Right. So it's just an interesting visualization. And that's included in the slides. So I'll just link the whole repository so you get everything. Right. But good news, this might be hard to wrap your head around now. But when it comes to 
uh, sort of using our intuition to drive abstractions in Haskell, the, the Haskell implementation is actually much simpler than what you just saw, and you can use it to inform your understanding later when you get into it. So there is a kind of feedback loop here for some of the harder things. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to kind of hang on until the end uh, once they've got a good understanding of Haskell, because this is the foreign part uh, for most people. Okay. Uh, and how are we doing on time? We're good. Okay. 10, oh, 20 minutes already. Shoot. Um, okay. So how do we translate this to Haskell? Um, well, in Haskell, we have to understand that we have a, a sort of discrete analog to all this stuff, where before we were operating in sort of a continuous geometric setting, right? We're in the, the sort of implicitly in the reals here. Um, in Haskell, we have, have to talk about sort of discrete translations where we talk about uh, finite points all the time, right? And what we can do to drive this is just think about the maybe monad most of the time, right? Just to refresh everyone, maybe A, if you're a beginner, is uh, either the just case, which contains a single A, whatever A is, uh, or the nothing case, which is a kind of unital case, which marks uh, either I've got nothing or a failure in computation or something similar. The functor instance uh, and the applicative instance, the monad instance, won't usually do anything with the nothing case. We only care about a sort of dumb application of whatever functions we're working with to the thing in the just case, right? So uh, think about uh, like the applicative, you know, apping over some function uh, in A, really what we're doing is we're, we're pattern matching, getting the thing out of the just case and then applying F, right? And then wrapping it up in a just again. Or in the fmap case, we're just saying just of, you know, apply my function to my A and so on. Right? Now this map, um, you can think of as kind of a, a functor. Uh, I mean, it's a monad, so obviously it's gonna be an endo functor. But um, it corresponds with a map, uh, which takes an A and adjoins a base point to it. Right? Uh, so you think I have A or I have some base point. And we, if we remember from um, actually some of uh, Bartage's uh, content, the base point, the picking of base points, a, a map from the terminal object to any A is kind of equivalent to this in some sense, uh, and actually in a precise sense, uh, where you take the unit and you sort of pick out a specific A and say, this is my, my base point, and that morphism defines the base point, right? So that's what we're saying here. We're saying A and its base point. Right. And using this fact, we can, we can kind of formalize the notion of pointed in Haskell to be maybe A, right? So um, just going through some, some sort of calculus without uh, going too heavy into like Yoneda or any of the adjoint functor theorems, uh, you can kind of do this with just sort of high school arithmetic in the same way that you can, you can do a lot of type arithmetic. So for instance, if I wanna figure out what the product of two pointed spaces was, like I did prior in terms of its geometry, in terms of the visual, uh, I can actually just sort of take a look at like maybe A tuple of maybe B, uh, and I can simplify the notation just so everyone knows what I'm doing here. You can apply a distributive law, uh, you can apply uh, some reassociativity and you end up with something that's like maybe either A, maybe B, or sorry, uh, either A or either B or A, you know, comma B. And for people that know uh, what this data type is, uh, this, this huge nested either thing here is actually the these data type that we're actually familiar with in Haskell. And it was the original sort of impetus for this talk. It was, you know, wait a minute, the pointed product is actually really simply maybe these in this case. So what is these? Uh, <laughs> and, and how do we think about these? Uh, is it just a, a sort of interesting ad hoc abstraction or maybe do we miss the, uh, the point by a unit? Is it like uh, the semi-group version of the pointed product, uh, you know, similar to a, a monoid where you just kind of have forgotten the unit and maybe we need a little bit more structure to make it uh, sound? Uh, that was the, the motivation for all of this, right? And the these data type, just to refresh, is 
data B is AB, we have a this case containing an A, a that case containing a B, or these containing both. So it looks like a zippy structure, right? Uh, pointed co-products are slightly easier, but also slightly more abstract. Um, if you remember, we don't want to take just sort of the dumb disjoint union of, of points. Uh, we actually need this to be a sort of co-product with a base point attached. And the closest thing we have to uh, that abstraction is the wedge sum that we already saw. Um, so implicitly what we're doing with uh, these these sort of the sort of co-product of pointed types is uh, we're actually conflating points under the hood um, to make it work with our, our correct notion of pointed co-product, right? A, a co-product in, in the category of pointed spaces. Um, and this is where I had to sort of lean on category theory a little bit uh, because normally what I would say was like, oh, if we you know just add this thing out, we get two plus A plus B, like a bool or A plus B. But that's not actually quite correct um, because the notion is taking the co-product and then under the image of the, the sort of uh, free functor that lands you in the category of pointed spaces, then you adjoin a, a unit to that. So actually we're not uh, you know, doing a sort of straightforward addition uh, for, for co-products here. We're, we're actually taking a push out, uh, which conflates those two points in, in the same way that we did for the two circles. Uh, and we have one plus A plus B as opposed to two plus A plus B instead. So just reassociating, we have maybe either A, B, and that actually defines a wedge product in, in Haskell right, for these, these sort of discrete types. Yeah. Now the smash product is slightly harder to visualize because there is some trick going on here, right? But we know what the product is in Haskell, right? It's maybe these A, B. We know what the wedge is now. So we can form a smash product in Haskell. Um, we, we just have to do some sort of quotienty tricks here. So we, we take the definition of uh, the pointed product modulo uh, a wedge of the same two things. Uh, and if we expand the, the sort of product out here, we note that one plus A plus B plus A times B mod one plus a plus b uh, is sort of a, a pretty straightforward quotient. You can actually treat this uh, not quite like division, but you can just sort of eliminate those because you're conflating those uh, via this relation, right? The one plus a plus b relates to uh, a point and you can smash those down to a single uh, base point and you end up with maybe a b. So that's a smash product in Haskell. It's actually rather simple when you stare at it. <laughs> It's uh, like the calculus isn't, but the, the data types actually end up being pretty simple, right? The, the pointed product is, uh, you know, one plus a plus a times b. The wedge is one plus a plus b, and the smash products is one plus a times b, right? That's, we, we all know how to, we can all probably think of a, a use case for that or have had use cases for that before, right? So, in the end, we end up with these three data types for the, the geometric stuff we just did in Haskell, right? We end up with, uh, I called it CAN, uh, terrible naming conventions at the time, but uh, you know, it's the unit plus A plus B plus A times B. The wedge, you know, like what we just said, nada or here A or there B. Uh, and the smash is nothing or, or that should actually be, uh, is it nothing? What do they call? I don't. I don't even remember what I call that. It's not nothing though. It's um. Man, I got. I have to check my own library because I forgot. <laughs> I just typed that in because it was. Uh, I'd been typing it all night. Um, I forget what to call it. It's it's the unit case. You get it, right? Right. So there's a little bit of skimping and, and massaging that needs to happen, and maybe some more details that need to be given if we're going to fully formalize this theory. Uh, for instance, we need to track uh, what we mean by in terms of base points. We uh, probably need to justify things in terms of like, you know, what uh, what adjunction we're using to, to pull some of these tricks and where we're using Yoneda and so on. But I wanted to keep it really simple just so we're not uh, getting bogged down in the sort of categorical details because they're there. It's sound. Um, uh, we've, or I've sort of done the proofs for this stuff. And 
it, it's all there, it, but it sort of draws from the intuition uh, to, to focus too much on the category theory at this point. So I just, just as an aside. Um, now, one of the cool things uh, that I did with this was, you know, I had my pointed product and I had my wedge product and I really wanted to get to smash product. I wanted to figure out what that meant, particularly because when you can say something about the ambient uh, category that you're working in, in terms of like if it's closed monoidal or if it's symmetric closed monoidal, uh, you can talk about the smash product as a uh, monoidal tensor internal to the category of pointed spaces for that ambient category and it forms its own sort of symmetric monoidal uh, tensor right or if you know if it's not symmetric it forms its own monoidal tensor in that space uh, so you get some some interesting facts about wedges and you get some interesting facts about smash um, and how it like distributes over wedges and, and how it forms sort of base point preserving function spaces um, just by knowing that it's there. So that, that was my motivation for trying to find a smash product that, that actually made sense for Haskell. Right? I haven't done anything interesting with it yet. It's just sort of sitting in a library, <laughs> which is actually public and on Hackage at this point under uh, the, the package smash, where I've sort of collected a lot of these facts about uh, uh, smash products and wedges and can and, and sort of done the calculus and how it distributes over, how they distribute over each other and some nice you know, facts about how they play with uh, like foldable, traversable, that kind of thing. Uh, so if you do want to see it, uh, definitely take a look at the, the library as we're going through this. It might help drive some intuition. Right, how are we on time? Oh, Got to speed up. All right, so what is these? Uh, just back to the question, because that's, that's the gist of the, the, the sort of geometric stuff that I wanted to go through. But really, what was interesting was, was the question of what are we staring at when we're looking at these, right? And there's no real good intuition for it for me. And when I was staring at it, I was kind of like, oh, that's, that's nice. That's a little ad hoc. That's, um, you know, great. Uh, I could probably find a use case for it, but, eh, you know, it's not particularly interesting. Um, but the point of product work kind of, you know, pointed me in the direction of, you know, what if these is kind of the semi-group to my monoid here? It's these is to the pointed product as semi-group is to monoid. But actually, I was surprised to find out that it wasn't. Um, these is actually quite principled. Uh, and it's not, not principled in the way that you might think. Um, and actually, it was surprising to, to me, just to sort of ruin the surprise. Um, these is actually a pointed product in a different encoding of pointedness uh, for, you know, Hask. Um, the encoding that we've been using has been sort of pairs of objects, right? A and its base point. And morphisms would, you know, from, from A to B would uh, go from A to B, but they, you would have to make sure that the base points sort of map to each other, right? Uh, but there's an, al there's an alternative encoding, right? Uh, objects are Haskell types, so, you know, A of type type. Uh, morphisms would be from A to B with its base point adjoined via this coproduct. So maybe B, so it's A to maybe B, right? Um, and it turns out that these, these encodings are equivalent by uh, a functor in a very loose sense. Uh, the functor being um, if I have some A, right, then I map that to A uh, and the you know, adjoining of its base point with another base point, right? And for morphisms, uh, I sort of have this uh, bind going on where I have an F from a B adjoint base point and, and I bind over this. I, I sort of make use of the Kleisley arrows in, in maybe. And then for any morphism that goes from maybe A to maybe B, which makes sure that it maps the nothing case to the nothing case, um, then this corresponds with F and G must be a bind. So uh, an application of a Kleisley error, right? Now this is loose in the sense that um, in, we're, we're making some assumptions about the structure of our types. Um, in, in the case of the first encoding, uh, sort of a function from int to int and the identity is uh, actually a valid object, but there's no type uh, that you can form 
such that uh, A adjoined its base point uh, is, no, my tilde went wrong, but there should be a tilde in that space right there, is equivalent to a function from int to int. So there are some drawbacks here. We do need to formalize a little bit about where we are and what encoding we're working in, and it would help to have a language of category theory to say that at this point. Uh, and I might formalize this in maybe a blog post or something a little bit later, but for now, uh, take it. Um, yeah, so that's what these is. So whichever is nicer, uh, you have a somewhat equivalent coding here, right? So geometry gives us this great intuition that we can use and bring in and try and uh, formalize in, in Haskell. And we kind of get this nice feedback loop between um, you know, geometry in Haskell and category theory that we can use to sort of translate uh, results across fields and say interesting, meaningful things about some of the types that we stare at. Uh, and even for things that are, are sort of as mundane as the maybe monad, you can actually get quite deep in where you're, you're taking your inspiration and, and what you're doing with the monad. Uh, and often it's people's first monads that they learn. But, you know, I guarantee people have not thought about this uh, until the past year, <laughs> right? It's, it's an interesting uh, set of results that we've, we've found. Right? So I would encourage everyone, just as a, a point here, you might not have gotten it, you might have followed along, you might know this stuff already, but um, take your ideas from everywhere. Uh, learn category theory because you can make this all so much easier. Implementing the libraries for, for Smash took five minutes uh, and a night <laughs> uh, just to write down all the facts and just knowing that, hey, look, I'm staring at a co-product, I'm staring at a product, I'm staring at, you know, a, uh, monodal tensile here. I know, I know that, uh, you know, facts about uh, sort of how co-products and uh, products distribute over each other or don't. Um, the facts about currying, all this stuff, just sort of drop out as soon as you know what you're staring at. And if you can come to Haskell with interesting ideas uh, and you can find a way to translate them to category theory, you can often find interesting results in unexpected places. Right. Right. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, MNIP for actually making the offhand comment that started me on this, which is we were talking about these and trying to figure out what these is. And he mentioned that, hey, look, I can do this nice sort of distributive trick with, uh, uh, no, no, he, I, I mentioned the distributed trick, like, hmm, what's this type that I'm staring at? He's like, oh, that's, that's a product for pointed types. And that sent me off on all of this stuff. So. Uh, thanks to him. Uh, thanks to Haskell Love for tolerating my presence. And I hope you guys enjoyed something a little bit lighter than, uh, than the usual talk. That's it.